Hello, and welcome to the Catching the Octopus podcast. Here, we will explore how connecting inward gives us an advantage outward. We openly talk about the obstacles and challenges and difficulties that life throws our way and how they become moments of gratitude and things that can benefit us when we look back on our lives. I'm your host, Naomi Hurley, and it is my mission to bring you top quality guests that will share with you openly their obstacles and also the techniques they use to go inward that strengthens the way that they serve themselves and others at the highest level. Thank you for joining. Let's get started. Welcome to this episode of Catching the Octopus podcast. Today, we're going to be speaking with Stuart Cumming. Now, Stuart has worked as um, primary school principal and teacher in schools across WA, including the Gascoigne, Pilbara, Kimberley, Goldfields, well, Wheatbelt and the Southwest. And he's also worked in the United States of America. So Stuart's also currently active and serving as a major in the Australian Army as an active reservist having enlisted in 1980. He describes himself as a home handyman having self-built two small homes and he is an active amateur radio operator. So he should be good at this podcasting stuff, right? Um, And he's also currently learning Morse code. So Stuart has a passion for the outdoors and bringing nature-based experiences to children, many of whom have limited opportunities to experience nature firsthand. Stuart and his wife, Jennifer, have five sons who all share his passion for the outdoors and three grandchildren with a fourth on the way. Oh, congratulations, Stuart. Thank you. Uh, He enjoys cricket, snowboarding, kite surfing, hiking, camping, traveling, and four-wheel driving. So welcome to the podcast, Stuart. Thank you. We, Stuart and I first met um, when he was a principal at Eaton Primary there for a while, and um, I was sitting on the board. So we actually... Did a fair bit of a few fair few things together um, in that board space. And he was also principal there when my son was going through. So I um saw him as a parent in that parent relationship as well. So I, knowing him, grabbed him, have harassed him for I think about you know six months now to say, hey, it's been, Stuart, it's you been need a little while, podcast. hasn't it? <laughs> it has. <laughs> and here we are. Eventually, I got it together. <laughs> we do there. We, yeah, we get there yeah. eventually, don't we? Yeah. Um, so you have had heaps of experience in leadership in a whole range of different things, you know, within the Army Reserves, within the teaching aspect and principles. What would you say? Let's jump into the, the crux of it now. What, yeah. in your opinion, is a critical leadership trait? I, th- I think it's... Um having time for the your people like mm. for, for the team and it's about the relationships and spending time with the team so as a as a school principal the 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 relationships are the parents the board the teachers the staff the the ER, the education assistants the children you know it's 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 not it's 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 a whole heap of levels and and it's to have it's to put time and effort into those relationships. Um, I'm not one of those, well, I try not to be one of those uh, administrators that locks himself in the office. I think you've got to be out, mm. out and about. And if you kind of relate that to the military, it's like, you know, you you, you get your generals that stay in the headquarters and then you get your, your generals that are out in the front line. And if you look at any military history, um, all the the memorable and the good the generals that have an impact are the ones that are out out in the field and mm-hmm. um, so not so much in the in the army because the experience in the army hasn't been uh, war fighting but yeah. um, but certainly with in in schools it's been you've got to get out and about and and spend a lot of time and put put that um, all that administrivia, to one side and if it doesn't get done on time it doesn't get done on time yeah and and yeah. don't lose sleep over that um so i think that's that's probably it it's it's relationships and and putting the time in mm. and i i feel that um passion from you for relationships because um being on in that board position you know the way that you would 
contact me and just soundboard and just talk and and just um, go through those sorts of things, I felt was um, a really strong trait of yours because the end game for you was the best interest of the kids, right? So it's whatever yeah. had to be done to actually make sure that came through. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes things don't go your way, you know, think things happen that, that you're not, so there's wins and losses and, and you, and you, sometimes you've got to be, you've got to be strong enough to know when, when you've made a bad call or you, or you, you know, someone's come up with an idea that maybe is, is, wasn't yours, but um, I can't think of any examples offhand, but um you I'm just, sure there's lots though, right? Yeah, there's, there's, <laughs> so they're, not the, they're not the ones you remember. No. Um, but if you've got those relationships with people, that's that's important. You know, um, I think, you know, you, there's less chance of that, you know, talk behind the scenes. You know, if, if, if you have that relationship, you find out from the people rather than secondhand from mm. gossip. Uh, yeah. And... and um, You'll find that if you've got good relationships, then when people are, when you're introducing something new into an organisation, people aren't just saying what they want you to hear. Yeah. Um, they'll they'll do what they do, and mm. and you you pick up whether is that is that the way we want the organisation to head or not. Um, but if you don't have those relationships, you'll just you know you'll just keep hearing what they want what they think they want you to hear. Um, yeah. and, and would it be fair to say as well that maybe one of the other traits you think is important is a good sense of humour? Because I've heard some great stories of people who've worked with you, Stuart. I, I wouldn't. I think I've just got a sense of humour, I guess. I, I, I wouldn't. Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, I know I know. often when I go to a new organisation, the comment that I hear is, we didn't know how to take you when you got so you know, maybe sometimes it goes too far the uh, <laughs> the other way. But you've got to have a good sense of humour. I mean, it, it's great fun with the kids, you know, particularly. Mm. Um, and I think if you've got a if you've got a uh, a good sense of humour, it, it really helps. When when I when I applied to be an officer with the with the Australian Army, yeah. um, I went through a, a it's called a warrant officing commission, commissioning scheme. So I worked my way up through the ranks, and when I sat the 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 board which is the the selection process one of the, one of the one of the questions was you had to you had to do a talk and it was i think it was a 2 minute or 3 minute talk or something without notice and all the other and there's i don't know there was a dozen or so people applying at the same time and all these people were giving their talks on military yeah and and you know their their history and what they've been up to and when it was my turn i gave a talk about my dog so our our dog our dog <laughs> we were living up north at the time and the, our dog was called lua and the reason she was called lua is we'd throw her into the water <laughs> and she'd have a bit of a swim round and if she wasn't taken by a croc then it was safe for the kids to swim <laughs> so i told that story and it, you know embellished it a bit you know of course, um, of course. it was safe water we wouldn't have done that but um yeah, yeah. and they got a huge laugh and then uh, afterwards i'm thinking Wow, I probably shouldn't have gone that. I should have gone the. I should have gone the. Um, you know, the, military the military kind route, of yeah. stuff. And another yeah. guy gave a talk about his lawnmowers. He he collected lawn, and it was. And out of that dozen, there were two that so, that were selected, and it was me and this other guy that talked about <laughs> his lawnmower. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, so I think maybe maybe even even in the the military aspect of um, leadership, it's it's a sense of humour is important. Yeah, well, I think it it shows like one of the other things, obviously, is authenticity, right? And coming through who we are and and that relating in relationships. And I think a sense of humor allows us to do that, right? It allows people to see a quirky human side to us, not just this stiffly leader that sits in a leadership position. Yeah, yeah. I was just trying to work out how to maximize you, so I don't have to look at myself, but I I can't work <laughs> do that, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it. Um, can you can you just repeat that? Yes, yes. Um, what, what was I saying? Oh, you know, the um, it gives us when when we do have a sense of humor, it gives us that opportunity to show up authentically. And when we are in that authentic space, I think that's what builds trust with people as well. So even though it may be because of a practical joke, or you might be doing something a bit silly, but people get to see who you truly are, and that helps build trust, right? And 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 you know when it's built trust when 
the shoes on the other foot and they're playing practical jokes on you, you know, and you, you just, you just know, you know what I mean? You just know, yeah, yeah that, that's, that's priceless. That's, uh, that's, that's great. Um, but yeah, I, I think a sense of humor is important. And but, but I think even with the kids, you know, it just helps you um, connect with them. You know, they, mm. they can see mm. that. Some, sometimes, particularly the little kids, they don't get your jokes, but the, <laughs> <laughs> the adults in the room do, so that's, uh, yeah, that's yeah, okay. that's all right. Makes yeah. it. So with, um, with the Army, you, I know that you um, were quite an integral part of when there was flooding in the, in the northwest of Western Australia. Can you take me through kind of that situation and, and let me know what, what do you think was the strength in your leadership um, that – created that collaboration because it was a bit of a collaborative approach yeah right? you had to you work yeah. were working with a, a range of people so I guess um you know I got a phone call and uh, I think a day or two days out from the flooding and and asked to go up and and be a liaison officer based out of Fitzroy Crossing mm -hmm. and I used to be principal at Fitzroy Crossing but it was 20 years ago and um and however those relationships that I'd built up were maintained. Do you know what mm, I mean? So, mm -hmm. so that was that was integral to that role as a liaison officer, kind of the conduit between the, the military, uh, the sorry, defence, the um, because we had army, air force, and navy up there. So, with the the the, the link between defence, the community, um, Department of Fire Emergency Services. Um, who were also, you know, who were the lead agency. So it was that um, con connectivity. And mm. the, the fact that, so I, I flew in, um, I think it was two days after the, the flooding and people were in a bad way, you know, it was, yeah, it yeah. was, it was, uh, and I've never seen so much water there. You know, we, we flew in, landed in, um, landed on the, uh, the oval and it was the first kind of outside, um, that had been in besides yeah, yeah, like the first contact. Yeah. Well, foreign emergency services had been in and had been yeah. doing their bit and the local foreign emergency had been doing their bit, but it was the first. And um, I, I remember getting off the chopper thinking, I wonder if anyone will remember me, you know, it was mm. 20 years ago and I would, wasn't in my school gear. I was in my army gear and um, we'd, we'd had this uh, talk from, uh, the defence the, the day before in Broome before we went out to Fitzroy and they'd talked about you know cultural sensitivities and don't mm -hmm. you know the do's and don'ts and one of the one of the don'ts is you, you don't just go up to people and particularly women and 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 make you know contact and handshake yes. you let them you kind of let them come to you so anyway yeah, I got off yeah. the I got off the plane and 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 I was what, you know, the, some of the, the, the key leadership people up there are, are women and they, they came up and gave me a big hug and, mm. and tears are streaming. Stuart, you're here. Like, <laughs> I couldn't believe, I, here I am thinking, will they remember me? And, yeah. and they did. And um, yeah. so that was, that was great. And word kind of got out that I was there and just, they weren't shy or, or shame, they call it, to, to come up and talk to me about what, needed to be done so if they had problems uh communicating or getting a message across to community people you know i was that conduit and i think mm -hmm. knowing it was funny because when i got the role i thought what am i what am i going to do as a liaison officer you know i don't yeah. know i won't know what to do and yeah. i tell you what i did not stop from the moment i woke up till the moment i went to to, to bed you know it was just full on but so enjoyable but i think the key was the relationship so the military stuff i knew i, mm. I knew knew about the assets you know the 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 airframes and the and the um vehicles and and all that sort of thing but i knew mm. and i knew the community and i could could so i think i think that worked really well was was the relationships again you know that we mm. mentioned that we mentioned before and and I think like I, I love that, and it definitely comes down to that. And and most of the guests that I've had, in some way, have spoken about relationships or collaboration or you know establishing rapport with people as being the key element, you know, and and mentorship programs, you know, and having someone that they can look up to to help them come through as their emerging leaders and things like that. And I'm sure you would have been a mentor to many people. 
Um, yeah, it's funny, you know, you, you, you don't line people up and say, I'm going to be your mentor. It just tends to happen. And, yeah. and I, I kind of, you kind of judge your success, I guess, as, as over time, how many, how many staff have gone and promoted that, that you've worked with over the, over the years, you know, that, that you've seen potential and, and they've come up, um, you know, from teaching positions to, um, to leadership positions or yeah. from education assistant positions to to teaching positions and that's very and that mentorship happens all the time i think it's really important that you that you promote and push your people you know mm. if, mm. if you see potential in people um I, one of the things i do is make sure that they are given every opportunity to you know i'll give them days off to go and work on applications and 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 just even to become lead teachers within the school because they um sometimes they just need a bit of a push you know yeah. many of them are doing the job anyway and it's like you just want them to to get recognition for that and to do that they've got to they've got to jump through a few hoops. So you, you kind of, you kind of push them a bit. Yeah. And I think, you know, when you said you were going, when you were going up North and you were like, what am I going to do as a liaison? You know, that's a natural reaction for most people, especially when they're moving into something they're unfamiliar with. Right. So moving them into that higher teaching position, they're probably like, Oh, I don't know if I've really got what it needs, what I need to have to be in there. Right. But yeah. you see it as their leader. I went to the Solomon Islands with the army and um, I was there for, I don't know, six months or something, seven months. And, and I was a liaison officer there. And um, that was, it took me probably two months to develop the relationships. Yeah. So I was, I was out and about and, um, you know, all over the, the archipelago um, meeting people and getting to know people. And, and that took that, it took a long time to develop those relationships, but that was okay because I had that long, you know, there was that long mm. lead time. Whereas mm. in the, in the, the, the floods in the Kimberley, I, I needed to be, I needed to have those relationships as soon as I, you know, got off, got hit the ground basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. There, I didn't, I didn't have to spend time developing those relationships. Well, you didn't have the opportunity all the time, did you? The grace no, of time. No, no, yeah, no. Yeah. Um, and so it was just the the hard work, hard yards you put in when you were based there 20 years before wow. that had still come yeah. through. Amazing, amazing. And um, it was lovely to reconnect with people. And mm. what was what was amazing was many, um, many of the kids who had been at the school as students when I was the principal were now the leaders were now yeah. you know the the elders and these growing up uh, men and women are coming up to me and and remind you know telling me who they were their name and I'm like yeah. oh my god you know because they look so different <laughs> and uh and they're the leaders and they you know it was I mean that was that was uh an absolute blast just uh just working with 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 them and and making a difference was great yeah, because as a principal or even as a teacher, it would be like time would stand still, right? Because the, there's kids coming through at the same age consistently and that's the world that you live in. So for someone to actually then be an adult, it's kind of like, hang on a minute, how yeah. did that happen, right? <laughs> I, I, I remember the first time I was at a school and one of my ex-students had a student at the school. Yeah, <laughs> And I'm right. like, oh, I, must, I must be getting on. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, it's, um, it's interesting. And I know, well, my, my son's 20 now, so he, um, he has some fond memories of quite a few of the teachers from Eaton Primary himself and he would, you know, come across them in the shops and you can see them going, oh, Bryce, like, <laughs> oh my God, like, you know, you're an yeah. adult now. <laughs> and it, it's great when you see them and, and you, you know, we, we've had a few people, few tradies come to the school and, and they're ex-students who who I've worked with, and you just go, oh wow, I, I, you know, I'm you're yeah. just so happy to see things have worked out, and you know they've they've they're, they're doing things. Mm. And I just I I love your passion for the kids. I mean, it's when at, in the leadership role that I saw you in, it wasn't just about leading the teaching staff. I, I saw you being a leader for those kids, and I remember one story I just wanted to share was at the um, sports carnival, swimming carnival. Um, and there was one of the young, the young man that had the learning difficulties and physical yeah, difficulties. Yeah. 
and how you got him. There was like the walking race and you kind of just got him and rushed him to the end of the pool and the look on his face to not only have finished, but not finish last. I'll never get that out of my mind. That was just <laughs> amazing. That's great. Yeah, I, I didn't want to finish last either. I was with him on that. <laughs> I was paired up with the right person, right? <laughs> yeah. His his mum actually came up to because he didn't want to get in the water. Um, so I I jumped in with him. Uh, yeah. And and his mum came up to me afterwards, and they're they're the moments that you just love. You know, they're just so rewarding. Mm. When she just said that was just that's the, he's been at quite a few carnivals, and that's the first time he's actually got in the water. Um, oh. So that was that was that was great. And, and those moments are life-changing and, and you probably will never know or see or feel how that's changed his life. But, you know, there'll be a point where he's in his 20s, 30s, 40s, where he's going to sit there and that memory will come back, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. and um, and you've been a pivotal part of that. And, and you've done that for so many humans across the whole it's, of WA. It's, it's so rewarding when you see... Um, you see even the impact that the teachers have on on the kids and you see mm. you know what a kid will come in the door in kindy and as and and what they go out the door you know at the end of year six and and particularly those challenging kids that mm. uh, that that have behavior issues because of whatever's going on in their their home life and and um you t you can turn that around and that's that's extremely rewarding mm. yeah no most definitely so between well, between the army and, you know, the teaching and the kids and stuff like that, is there any one moment that kind of just keeps coming back to you in your memory that you've got? Um, I know this, yeah, probably yeah, a question look, from look, left field. There's probably, yeah. the, the, <laughs> there, was this, there was this student at, at one school who he was year might have been pre-primary or year one, I can't remember, but he was a tiny little thing. And yeah. um, every morning he would have a meltdown. And his, his mum, you know, gave me permission to um, bring him over to the office and sit yeah. him down because he yeah. just, he just, um, he just lost, lost it big time. And yeah. the language that came out of his mouth was, stuff I hadn't heard yeah right <laughs> like it was <laughs> it was pretty <laughs> it was pretty full on anyway so we it wasn't just me it was the whole school worked with him Horse, and yeah. when he when he graduated as a year six he got the citizenship award oh. and and I was bawling <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I, I like and and that's that's a memory that just keeps keeps coming back and they're the, they're mm. the they're the, they're what you do the job for mm. Mm, yeah, no, most definitely. I'm tearing up a bit now, just oh. think, just thinking of it. <laughs> <laughs> Bringing the emotion yeah, through. Yeah. But it's, I, I suppose that's, that's another indication to me of strong leadership as well is that empathetic nature and that deep caring we have for each other as humans, right? So whether it's in a school space or in, a, in the army or in a, a large organisation, it's actually having real true empathy for people and wanting yeah. to get them to the next level. If you're enjoying this podcast and you want Naomi or any of her guests featured on your podcast or as a keynote speaker at your next event, you'll find their contact details included in the show notes. If you'd like to learn more about how you can work with Naomi individually or as part of your strategy to improve leadership in your business, then review the courses, offers, and services at getupandgrowconsulting.com.au. It's and it's it's really annoying when you see see leaders that aren't empathetic. Mm. It's like you just go, really? Mm. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. And we, we see that all the time, you know. Um, you know, out in the big wide world, particularly at the moment, and and you just go, oh. Um, but at, at every level, yeah, empathy is is um, is, is important. Mm. I, I love the ones that are, um, they look like they're really prickly, you know, and they look like they're really um, staunch and have no empathy, but they've teddy bears underneath. Like I just love, <laughs> yeah. love those people and love working yeah. with them as well because they're, they're trying to be all bravado, but they're just really great humans underneath all that, right? And I yeah. think that comes through in strong leadership. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, 
no, that's that's uh, that's that's that is really the really the case. But uh, yeah, I'm not so good at picking that up. <laughs> <laughs> So I've got a couple of questions that I ask all of my guests um, when I yeah. go through. Um, so Do I get a score out of 10 for the answer? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> An A, B, C, D, yeah, or yeah, yeah. Is that right? Um, so with, with obstacles, like I believe that um, a lot of the times the, the challenges that we go through in life and the obstacles that we have in front of us can often create sort of like a sense of going inward to get more strength to go through. So What's the biggest obstacle you've had to overcome and, and how did that strengthen your connection inward? Gee, that's a, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I'll talk about, I'll probably talk about when I went to the States. Um, yeah, yeah. So 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 I, I applied for teacher exchange and I'd been a, a, a principal for, I don't know, 20 plus years and, and hadn't been in the classroom. And I applied for teacher exchange. And, and with when you do teacher exchange, they don't do it anymore, unfortunately. But when, when they did teacher exchange, if you're an administrator, you, you have to go into the classroom. Um, yep. you, you can't go overseas and run a school and, and I wouldn't have wanted to. Mm -hmm. Or maybe after mm -hmm. I got there, I, I, I did. But, <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah. so so... I just wanted to do an exchange and I couldn't, I had to find a, a permanent vacancy at the school. So I was, I was a phys ed teacher or phys ed trained primary teacher. And yep. so I put in for phys ed positions and, and overseas and it was Canada, the States, uh, the UK. And a, a position came up as a computer technician, a computer teacher, IT teacher, yeah. slash phys ed teacher so you know in, in the half the day you taught phys ed half the day you taught it Stuart and I've seen your it skills <laughs> <laughs> how did that work yeah well google's amazing isn't yeah, it yeah okay <laughs> so so I I I wrote this big spiel about all the it you know talk myself up a bit all the it yeah. stuff I, I I had done and I thought how hard can it be and mm -hmm. and um Got the exchange, right? And yeah. and six, you know, they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. You you you're going to College View Elementary in Denver, Colorado, and um, the whole family, you know, we're going to be packed up and over we go. Anyway, about I don't know, two to three weeks out, the guy who I was exchanging with sent me a photo of his classroom, and mm. it was full of Macs. <laughs> oh, and I had never <laughs> used a Mac, but, and the whole school was Macs and they had iPads and MacBook, MacBook, uh, you know. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh my God. And then he sent me, he sent me this <laughs> thing and he said, um, oh, and you'll be running the, I. it's not just teaching IT, you run the whole school infrastructure, oh, no. <laughs> all the printer connections, all the networking. And I'm like, really? <laughs> That's so, awesome. So I, you know, after a little while, I went and bought a Mac. I bought an iPad and yeah, um, yeah. started using that. And when I got there, I just, I, I just fessed up to the principal and I said, "Look, <laughs> I, I, I can do the the teaching on the Mac. That's, you know, that was all right. But yeah, it's funny yeah. trying to teach kids how to steer a, a, a through a system that they know better than you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but. <laughs> The other thing I found out when I got there was it was a Spanish speaking school up to year two. So oh. it was an immersed in Spanish. So you didn't, they didn't speak English the, up to year two. And I was, I was teaching every class in the school. So half the classes couldn't understand me. <laughs> <laughs> so they gave me, they gave me an education assistant or a, a paraprofessional, they call them over there. Right. Who was my interpreter, but she couldn't understand me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'd have kids, I'd have kids come up to me, and they would say, they would say, I don't know what they were saying. Yeah. And I'd yeah. just go see. I go see, yeah, see to see. everything. And I think, I go, and I'd watch what they're doing because I think, I wonder what I said yes to. Um, so I guess that was a big challenge, and <laughs> and I really. Also, the challenge of getting back in the classroom. Yes. And it, and, it, yeah. and it really, so, you know, the language stuff we, we worked out and the computer stuff we worked out. And I completely revamped the whole way 
IT was taught and kind of brought it brought in the the, the way we we deal with it in Australia and change things mm. up and that was that was great um mm. and and um what was I saying, Naomi? <laughs> <laughs> I've lost my train of thought. Um, Just the, the obstacles that help create that strength, the strength and that connection inwards. But, you know, one of the things that I have noticed um, from knowing you and, and the things that you've done and then hearing that story as well is you've got this um, bravery of, I'll just go and suck it and see, right? Just it's an opportunity. And, you know, an what's, the, what's the worst thing that can happen? You yeah. Know? Like yeah. even if even if someone goes goes crazy at you, yeah, you know, you, you just you just go. Well, they're not going to okay. as long as they don't as long as they don't hit me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just just you know, and it just seems to work out in the end. You just you just kind of work your way through it. Oh, that's what I was taught the the, the teaching thing. So that was really good because I got back into the classroom after um after twenty years of not being in the classroom, mm. and I get home at the end of the day. And I just lie on the floor. Yeah, I was I was smashed, and yeah. um, it took me about two months to kind of get in the swing of it and, and get used to that change in in the exhaustion level. But yeah. what it did for me when I got back to Australia was it gave me a renewed appreciation. I think I'd I'd kind of forgotten how busy and hard the job of a teacher is, and yeah. and that brought me back to kind of back to reality that this this is what's involved and and um i guess gave me that empathy again for, yeah. <laughs> for, for the, the teachers and their workload and and um all well, that's uh you know that they uh they, i mean being the leader it's a, it's a different pressure and it's a different stress but it's of course um you kind of it was it was good to be reminded for 12 months what it was like to uh, you know to be a full-time teacher and, and there's a lot of pressure on teachers that I think people don't realise, or they think they do, but they don't really. And I know, you know, we were um, doing some discussions and working through the whole COVID situation and, you know, how do you run a school when half your teaching staff's off sick, you know, and you still got to sit there and, and produce for the students. And it's there's so many challenges that us laymen just have no idea about. It's, yeah, look, it's it's very very it's a it's a busy job like it's flat out you know there's a huge teacher shortage at the moment and mm. the re there's a reason for that you know it's it's hard mm. work it really yeah. is um if it was if it was um a, an easy job then we wouldn't have a teacher shortage but there's critical teacher even excuse me even now i should have learned how to hit mute while i'm um when I need to make it anyway, <laughs> um, those IT skills of yours. Yeah, right yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm on a Windows machine now. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, and we're speaking English. Um, yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's it's definitely yeah not as easy as it looks. I think people just drop their kids off in the morning, pick them up in the afternoon. If something goes wrong, they blame the teachers, blame the school, you know, without actually even realizing. I know my, my son had some real challenges um, while he was at school and I approached the teachers and had conversations with them when we set up like little diaries that went back and forward that we could communicate and communication books and things like that. But that was me being proactive as a parent. I wonder how many parents just sit back and have an expectation for magic to happen, you know, just click the fingers and the, the kids, be, you know, behave beautifully. And that's just not how humans work. And I, I, th I think one of the, the increased pressures that's on now is um, social media um, yeah. as not just for the, the pressure on the kids and that, but the pressure on the teachers that, you know, they're, they're, they're on all these sort of apps that are sharing what they're doing in class with the parents and mm. the parents are always expecting, you know, if they email a, a teacher or co contact a teacher via one of the apps that they'll get an instant response. And so the mm. teachers, the teachers are not, it's not like, um, you go home at the end of the day it's like you know um i've and i've got so i had you know so many staff that you say you've got to stop looking at your emails after hours you've mm. got to stop you know i mean one of the things i do is to to manage the stress levels i guess is is i have a, a, a so i live in australian right and the yep. the collie river is between me and work and i use the collie river as my 
you know, is that's the border. So when yes. I'm le when I'm leaving work and your mind's racing and there's all this, you know, stuff going on in your head, as soon as I cross that, I leave it behind. Yes. That's that's gone. And I, yeah. you know, I uh, I go go home and start, you know, dealing with home stuff, and then coming mm. back to work the next day, you cross that bridge and I mean and and then you <laughs> you pick it up again but you have to you have to distance yourself from it you know it's um and I, I guess that's the same in in all occupations you just mm. you just you can't be 24 7 you know I always say to, to my staff you know your family comes first work work comes second maybe third you might have some other you know some other but but um it's not number one you know, mm. it's, it's, and you, you've got to look after yourself. You know, it might be self, family, work, you know, uh, yes. and a, and a yeah. lot of people, a lot of people um, put too much pressure on themselves 24 seven with, with, with work. Mm, it well, doesn't, achieve, ex- doesn't achieve anything. No. And my experience is self is very rarely first from people. <laughs> 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 Me work with how many people I work with, it's very rarely. And you tell them to put themselves first. They don't know how to do it. They just... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, that, that's even quite an issue for, well, for myself, I've got a home-based business. So I do a lot of my stuff online or I'm in the client's, um, offices in the client space in that corporate. And when I first started, I was all hours day and night, I was just going. And then I made a conscious effort that at five o'clock, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. Five o'clock is it stops. It all goes, I don't answer emails. I don't do anything. And you know what? The world didn't stop. <laughs> brilliant. Brilliant. Oh, mind job. blowing. You know, yeah, I'm thinking, yeah. oh, but those people that expect me to get back to them, they they understand or they just wait until the morning. And I think we just it's the self-imposed pressure. You're right. I, I heard a I heard a thing from a, a business leader, I, you know, it was a few years back now. And he, he used to, if he got an email from someone, he'd just delete it. And he go if they if they really want me they'll send a second they'll get in touch with me a second time. <laughs> so it was. Oh, I thought I better not try that, but no, <laughs> <laughs> might not wash. But yeah. that's a good point to make, right? Like if it's urgent, people will get they will chase you up. If it's not, you but can it's even it. when people ring you, you know, and 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 if you don't have your phone on and answer straight away, it's like why didn't you what why weren't yeah. you available? What what's going on? You know, and it's like. Mm. I was out. Yeah. <laughs> I was doing yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't even answer personal calls after seven o'clock. I don't even answer personal calls. So I said, well, I to don't my answer family, it. I don't answer a lot of calls, but it's usually because my phone's flat or I've forgotten yeah. it, <laughs> forgotten where I left it. It's it's not actually planned. <laughs> Je- Jennifer, thinking... my wife, will attest to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, we uh, and that's that's that importance of putting ourselves first, right? That's my time that I sit down with my family, and you've got all day to ring me. If it's really urgent, you can text. I don't mind replying to a text, but I don't, you know, I suppose I'm talking all day as well. That's my time to chill out and and not have to, you know, talk. But it took me many years, you know, even when I was in corporate, I was working till 11 o'clock at night, going straight to bed, getting up, going to work. And I did that for years. And, um, And, you know, when I stopped doing that again, the world didn't stop. And, you know, a lot of people judge you on how many hours you work. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like, um, yeah, you look at a school car park and you you see it, you know, um, not necessarily any any organisation, um, yes. and and people are there long hours. Does, does that mean they're they're really committed, or does that mean they're inefficient? Yes, <laughs> yeah. totally agree. Um, <laughs> or they got their priorities all wrong, or they don't want to yeah. go home. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's like the people that send emails at four in the morning just to, to show you that they're really conscientious. <laughs> but you can you can program that, right? You can set that up. I, I don't know. Time. Ask an I ask an IT guy. <laughs> Trying ask, to give him, you ask him ask him in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just go see. <laughs> see, see. see. Um, so another question. Um when when what sort of challenge did you have in your life? that you ended up being grateful for? Because I, I, you know, in my life, I have these moments where I think, oh, you know, poor me, everything's falling apart. And then I look back and I go, oh, actually, if that didn't happen, then this wouldn't have happened, right? So we can get gratitude for that. Is there anything that comes to yeah, mind look, with you? So so I'm, 
I'm dyslexic, right? I, yep. I, um, and I, back when I was, I think it was in year three, was diagnosed, but it was a very early, like it wasn't even a thing then, you know. Mm. My mum, my mum read something in in a magazine, and I'm very grateful to mum who, hi Joan, if you're listening, <laughs> um, <laughs> that um, she she took me to a specialist that she found. And I, I ended up going to uh, Princess Margaret Hospital. There was a big wing upstairs. I was, a bus would come and pick me up and I'd go there and we'd do all this. Um, it was like a perceptual motor program, but yeah. I, you know, obviously I was a year three, I didn't know what I was doing. And just a whole lot of things like um, balancing on planks and learning to hop and all this, you know, all yeah. this sort of thing. And I'm like, well, how's that gonna help? Because I couldn't read all right. Um, mm, okay. And and it it worked, you know, it it really did help me, and um, I still have um, issues with writing and reading. Com computers are great because you know I can spell checks is my saviour. Yes, yeah. But I think that that learning issue that I had as a child made me be a teacher. Um, yeah. You know, and and that I think gave me empathy with kids and you know and and kids that um are struggling and mm. so i had i had um i had just a fantastic teacher my year four teacher she i had her for year three and four i didn't do year four twice <laughs> <laughs> i actually i actually no i won't say that so anyway my year three my year three four teacher um mrs eggers came and saw me about 12 years ago and I was a principal in, in uh, I was at Maidens Park Primary at the time and yeah. she, she made an appointment to come and see me and she just was, it was just brilliant. You know, she said, I always knew you'd, you'd do something, you know, and, and mm. you, you think she's, she made a difference. Like she made a real difference. My mum getting that diagnosis, Mrs. Eggers doing, doing, um, doing what she uh, what she did as a teacher was just mm. fantastic and I think that inspired me to really push the, the kids that are not quite there mm. you know um, and really try and work for those work so a lot of the work that we do in schools now is trying to help those um, those kids that are they're just a little bit under the benchmark you know they're they're just yep. but you know um, if you can't read and write, then you you're going to struggle you know yeah, um yeah. you're going to you're going to struggle whatever if you're into science or um history or whatever you're into if you can't read and write then mm. then in this day and age you're going to struggle so it's really important that we so i think that at the time i wasn't very grateful for you know being the um down the bottom end of the class and struggling and not keeping up and you know yeah. all this sort of thing but um I'm grateful because I think it made me a much better teacher and a much better leader to really try and push the boundaries for those kids that are, you know, the kid I, the, the one I told you about that, that lifted his game that used to, you know, I used to get into trouble a lot at school and I was, <laughs> you know, like I, I couldn't tell you how many times I got the cane. Like, yeah. Yeah. Me. Um, <laughs> I was, I was not a good, I was not, <laughs> Why am I, was, I not surprised? Anyway, I was not. Um, but anyway, so you know, there's hope. There's hope for those kids. <laughs> you can't write them off. You have got to work with them. And and uh, so I think all I think my childhood and 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 those um, issues I had growing up. I think I was. I think I'm grateful for them because yeah. it, it's it it made me who I am. Mm. And I see that in adults as well a lot of time, you know, like I, because um, I work with people and in that therapy space when I work, a lot of the time it's just, they're just barriers that they that people put up. So, because they're too scared to be really vulnerable, whether that's because they've, you know, their physical safety is at risk in their home life or when they were kids or whether it's because, you know, people that haven't been around people that understand them. And once you can actually break that barrier down it's like they kind of are like someone sees me and I'm enough. It's yeah. a really big moment, isn't it? Yeah, and and I th I think that you know we talked earlier about empathy, and I think when you've lived it, 
you have it. Mm. <laughs> Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, yeah. and when you haven't, yeah, like maths, I found maths reasonably easy and I was not a good maths teacher. Yeah. But, but, um, reading, you know, reading and writing, I struggle with and I, uh, and I think I, I really focused on, on teaching that well, you mm. know, to, to mm. kids that are struggling. Yeah. Well, one of my highlights, I suppose, from working with Eaton um, was the SAYA program. So I, I volunteered for the SAYA program for a year. So students at educational risk, for those of you who don't know, and just helping kids read and do their spelling words. And, you know, they'd have a spelling test. I'm not even a teacher. They have a spelling test and they'd come running over to me in the morning going, look at what I got on my spelling test. And there was just this beautiful rapport because I'd given them time, right? I'd help them feel enough. And just to watch them blossom and grow. Oh, oh look, I'm really excited about what's going on at uh, Eaton Primary at the moment. You know, we're, we've got a lot of programs in place um, that are just, I, I think, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing our results, you know, on the national testing in the next uh, mm. next year or two, because the, the programs are, are in their infancy now, but the kids will have had exposure to them for a few years. And I think it's, uh, you know, you can you can anecdotally see it already, but it'll mm. be it'll be nice to see it um, you know, on the on the, the testing. Definitely. And I think I love the way that the school is looking at different ways that they can provide the education. You know, like um, although I'm still a bit disappointed I didn't get to hold the chickens, but that's okay. I'll move you past that one day. <laughs> um having you know, the Garden of Eden, and it's not just about planting. They're looking at so many different things. They're looking at life cycles and sustainability. And oh, there's some really great projects there that that has been able to be coming in to help those, especially helps those kids that aren't the real big academics, but they're yep. still clever. Yeah, they right? love, you know, our, our um, sustainability program and that Garden of Eden program has turned around a lot of those kids that they just, they want to know what day, what what day, mm. can I can I go on an extra day? Can I go on at lunchtime? You know, they just love it um, mm. because it's just, it's just different. You know, it's them outside and, and dealing, you know, I did a, a Churchill fellowship Um I can't remember when it was. It's about uh, twelve years ago now, um, mm. and I went over to the UK and looked at looked at those sorts of things and yeah. and brought those ideas back and shared them with with schools around the southwest and and Perth and um, a lot of that stuff now you see and and I'm not saying it was because of me. Um, no, no, you know, no. There was there was there was right. like a um, a movement. You know, and, yeah. that, and and it was great to be part of that movement and just see that develop, and and you can see it now. You know, you 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 one of the one of the things I loved is so at Maidens we we built a forest. You know, we we planted mm. a forest um, in some areas that wasn't uh, that wasn't being utilised. At Eaton, we've we've planted. I think um, there's probably over 800 trees been planted in the last couple of years um, because we've got a it's a 15 acre site. I, I, if you give me five minutes, I can give you that in hectares. Because <laughs> <laughs> your maths is so on. Yeah, I just do that mentally. Um, but um, it's a big site, and it's a lot of trees on it. But you can, yeah. you, you've got to. You, there's more trees now, so we've 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 built yeah. we've built. I mean, one of the things that Mum and Dad used to do was take me to Kings Park back in the day when when we were growing up in Perth, and there was that nature playground there. You know, there was those mm. massive logs, and you you climbed on it, and it was great fun because you just did you didn't have that at home. So yeah. I've tried to work with the staff and the kids to kind of create that at the school, and you'll see lots and lots of schools now um, developing nature play areas in their in their schools and it mm. and it it's um gives uh, gives a bit of a challenge to the to the kids i know when when we built the the last play one of the big uh, playgrounds at school and I, I was speaking to the guy who built it and i said yeah. i said to him i want it as high as it possibly can be be within yeah. the guides of kids safe and i want as much risk as possible i you know yeah um push the boundaries yeah push the boundaries and he said oh he said that's the opposite of what most schools want and i said well that's what i want and um you yeah. know we we haven't had uh touch wood too, too many injuries yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the kids love it you know that's that's oh, one of the they learn to they... deal with risk you know and yeah. um yeah 
we we put a whole heap of limestone blocks in just limestone blocks because they were cheap and and um inexpensive and and you know as stepping stones and and what have and the kids love jumping from block to block and doing all this and the first week we put it in it was like a bloodbath at the the sick bay it was like yeah. oh my god yeah. what have i done well after the first week they all worked out how to balance and how to what to do yeah. and what they couldn't do and and it's um you know it's just the normal kind of um flow of of injuries now yeah. not to, you know very very rarely um uh, because they you know at at the school you can climb trees yes uh yeah. you know there'd be plenty you, you can have the risk um because otherwise the first time they they're on an unlevel surface or something they're going to trip over or break their foot or you know uh mm. so introduce risk at school um and and make play areas challenging I, I love that i love i love at lunchtime just out in the playground and just seeing the kids on all the all, all the equipment um well you know i've actually jumped across those limestone blocks myself. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, cool. it's it's hard not to <laughs> it's good fun it's really good fun have you been so, up on that uh one near the amphitheater the the, the tall log <laughs> no, I haven't been right. up on there. Right, yet. that's your next. That's your next. Cha- that's your next yeah, challenge. Okay. All right, I'll <laughs> next assembly. I'll rock over there and make sure the kids don't see me in case yeah, I fall. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, what, Stuart? Daily, weekly, or monthly practices do you do that help you connect with the inner self? Because I've kind of found, you know, when we're leaders, the strongest leaders I've seen are really comfortable in their own skin. You know, so is there anything that you do in particular? When you said the strongest leaders, I thought you were going to give me the answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 not at school now. You don't get the answer. I, I think, I, I think it's, um, it's when you're on, when you're not at work, it's going out and doing stuff. Mm, mm-hmm. It's not, it's not. Although there's a time and place to sit in front of the telly or, or jump on the computer. Yeah. I think you got to do stuff. You got to, you got to get out. And I, I think the best therapy for me is to get out in nature. Mm, Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I like, I like challenges and, and I just always, and I think that helps keep me sharp if Mm, you like. mm -hmm. So I, I, a couple of years ago started, when I went to the States, I started snowboarding as a, as a 50 year old, um, which was, um, hurt (laughs) (laughs) but it was a it was a great challenge and then when when uh when we got back here in COVID hit we were we were planning a a trip um to japan to go snowboarding and Mm -hmm. and and, um couldn't so i took up kite surfing um because i could do it in the backyard and and yeah it's just those sort of things that that challenge you that that get you outside and get your mind working as well keep Mm. keep keep you you sharp um, yes yeah you know um like i'm i'm into my amateur radio and i'm always doing something different you know mentally yeah. challenging you know like i'm i'm trying to learn morse code at the, the moment um which is 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 get i'm getting there uh, yeah yeah you know i'll do other stuff you know i'll i'll um go through i won't talk bore you with all the technical stuff but <laughs> Yeah, there's so many different things that you can do, but I think yeah. I think the the important thing is to to get out and about, you know. And and um, my wife and I love travelling, and mm, and mm. when we travel, we camp and four wheel drive, and we go, we kind of go to places that um, you're bit not your normal, or, little yeah. bit off 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 grid, you know. And yeah, and yeah. and that's I find that really um, refreshing, you mm. know. Um, when when you when you do that. So I, I think it's keeping busy, even if you just yeah. go for a walk, you know, it does, you know, go for a walk, but I, I find it so much better to walk. Uh, you know, we've got walks here along, along rivers and along, you know, rather than walking to the shops, walk, walk, walk through nature, you know, go, yes. go through yeah. some bush area. Uh, and there's yeah. plenty of it. There's, there's, you know, you might have to walk through a bit of suburbia to get there, but, um, but just make it a, a habit. And I think yeah. that, that that's important. Yeah. Well, there's so many different um, aspects to that. I could talk forever on that, even from an energy perspective, you know, like, so 
when we're in amongst people, there's so many thoughts. I mean, we have an EEG, right? So we've got electrical currents going through our brain every time we think of something or do something and that's clouding us. So when you get into nature, it gives you an opportunity to just be you. Yeah. And, you know, I, I used to have my ear pods in and, and, and listen to a podcast or something yep. when I'm, yep. and I stopped doing it. I just, yeah. it's just, it's just nice to just, just enjoy it for what yeah. it is, you know, to not be multitasking and having to, to listen, you know, your mind's probably racing anyway, but um, just to enjoy it, enjoy the space. Yeah. No, I love that. Definitely. So um, if anyone did want to reach out to you and just have a chat, pick your brain, that sort of thing, what's the best way that they can get in contact with you? Oh, probably, probably um, email is probably yeah. the best. Yeah, well, I'll have all those details in the in the yeah. show notes as well. And you're so on just, LinkedIn as well, are you? I am. Yeah, I am. I've got to try and remember my uh, my password though. <laughs> it's a bit of a challenge. Just <laughs> blow me away with the IT, but that's okay. I'm sure Jenny will know it. She'll oh. ask her. She, I'm sure she knows it. <laughs> oh, hey, it got to the stage where when their printers when their printers um died and and they needed help. There was, a, there was a teacher over there that knew more than me and they started just going straight to him. I was so relieved. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, well, look, thank you very much for jumping on and chatting with me today, Stuart. It's been a blast as usual. It's always great having a chat with you. No worries. Thanks, Naomi. Uh, pleasure to be on. Thanks for joining in and listening to this episode of Catching the Octopus podcast. It's been great having you here. And if you'd like to go and like and subscribe and maybe even leave a five-star rating if you think it's worth it, I'd really appreciate it. I look forward to seeing you in our next episode.